High Point University presents Lessons in Leadership Series, a roundtable discussion, is a production of UNCTV in association with High Point University. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to all of you, and welcome to this yet one more session with great minds, thought leaders, people who have influenced the lives of so many through their career and whose impact has been felt across the Star Heel State and across America and the world. It is the privilege for Hype University today to bring this panel of outstanding and accomplished leaders before you so that you can hear their thoughts, learn from their ideas, and so that we can all expand our horizons about the art of the possible. At High Point University, we pride ourselves that our students are exposed to the global competitive stage on which they must compete. We say we don't want to graduate job takers, we want to graduate job creators. We say we're not preparing students for the world as it is, but rather for the world as it's going to be. And so our purpose here is to always expand your minds, students and guests here today, about what can happen when you believe in the American dream and when you acknowledge and understand that those who work hard enough and smart enough can do amazing things, and in so doing, can touch the lives of millions. So it is my honor on this day to introduce to you to our panel. First, a lady who is the Secretary of Commerce in our own state of North Carolina, a lady who has been the Chief Communication Officer for Duke Energy, who has been the President of the Tanner Companies, ladies and gentlemen, Secretary Sharon Decker. Joining um, Secretary Decker this afternoon is a man who not too many years ago himself served as Secretary of Commerce in the state of North Carolina. He also served as the chairman of Phillips Textile Mills and the chairman CEO of Phillips Factor Company. And he is a man who has been on the Department of Transportation Board in North Carolina and served also as chairman as a of the Economic Development Corporation in North Carolina. And perhaps one of the more important things for all of us today, a person who has been the former ambassador, United States ambassador, to the country of Estonia. A friend I've known for 40 years. I'm glad that he's here today, because on this campus, students, the School of Business is named for his father. Ladies and gentlemen, Ambassador Dave Phillips. And then a gentleman who has uh, taken the world of business by storm. He is the chairman CEO of LabCorp, a company with 35,000 employees, does business in 40 countries around the world. Uh, he is a, a graduate of Princeton University and uh, the University of Pennsylvania School of Law. Uh, he resides in the state of North Carolina. His business is based in Burlington, North Carolina. It is a New York Stock Exchange company by the name of LabCorp. Ladies and gentlemen, the chairman CEO of LabCorp, Mr. David King. <laughs> well, Madam Secretary and gentlemen, it is my delight, in fact, my privilege on this afternoon to welcome all of you to the campus of High Point University and to welcome all of our viewers tonight on television and all those who will see you for generations to come in the classrooms of this university, and by extension, their parents and our alumni. It is special to have you here. Each of you brings gravitas in your own way. Each of you has a cadre of lessons you've picked up along life. And my job this afternoon is to dig deep and get to the bottom of this. <laughs> we got to figure out how all of you became so successful and what lessons our students might learn from you, and what are some of the good things that happen along the path of life, and some of the challenging things that happen along the journey of your life. So Madam Secretary, I'm gonna start with you. Your, your job, as I understand it, 
and for which I'm grateful that you have chosen to lead us in this way, is to promote the state of North Carolina, is to attract to North Carolina uh, companies that bring with them jobs and economic opportunities for all of our citizens. You have been secretary for two years? Two years. What has been your biggest surprise in these two years? <laughs> how mean politics can be. <laughs> it just seems to me that uh, jobs should not have a political uh, name upon them. That uh, whether you're Republican or Democrat, whether you're conservative or liberal, it really should not matter when it comes to job creation in North Carolina, from my perspective. And I think when the governor asked me to do this, he said, uh, Sharon, I know you're a registered independent, and I'm really great about that, because what we need is somebody who understands that this really isn't a political issue. This is about getting North Carolina's people back to work and growing this economy again. And I have found that not everybody feels that way about it. And so that has been a surprise. I guess I knew it. I guess like the rest of these guys, I've seen a little bit of House of Cards. And that's probably exaggerated, maybe just a little bit. But um, no, I, I think I've just been surprised at how extreme it is. And I think that's unfortunate. But I think there are increasingly folks who understand this is a common theme. This is a common purpose, a common goal we ought to share. Well, Sharon, you know, since 1990, I think it's a well-known fact that, that North Carolina has lost uh, two of five jobs we once upon a time in the glorious days had, yes. jobs in textile and apparel and furniture. Um, and of course, we're trying to recover from right. all this global competitive marketplace that we've experienced. How optimistic are you really that North Carolina will regain that in some measurable way? I can't even express how optimistic I am. I'm very optimistic because um, of our people, for one thing. This is a can-do kind of state, and we have a long history of being the first in many things, uh, the first to declare independence, right? Uh, the first state uh, where flight took place. There's so many things we can say, and I know that spirit is still here and that as we begin to recover from a very dark place economically, we will lead that recovery. Uh, so I'm incredibly optimistic. I'm also optimistic because of the companies that are already invested here. We have been so fortunate in history to build a strong base economy. And although we've seen a tremendous amount of change, particularly in manufacturing, we have been fortunate to diversify enough with companies like LabCorp and others that are growing, that are fundamentally in businesses are gonna see significant growth. And so I'm incredibly optimistic and uh, know that we're all gonna be, continue to be proud to be North Carolinians. Well, I know that you're proud of uh, a company that um, is located in North Carolina, of new, uh, just recently, that our students and faculty here know about it. It's called Ashley Furniture yes. Company, and of course, Ron Wanick, uh, the chairman uh, of the company, and Todd Wanick, the CEO, are very good friends of High Point University. Yes, our, are. One of our largest buildings on this campus is named the Wanick Center. And uh, how did that come about? And, and, and um, tell us a little bit about them, how they're growing, how many, how many employees, and so on. Well, it's uh, one of the world's largest furniture companies and most successful because of a very interesting and innovative business model, which the Wanix started and have uh, just done so successfully. And they were looking for a place to broaden their base of manufacturing, and they were caught by the history of furniture in North Carolina about the heritage that is here. We can't overlook the power of that because we have an amazing legacy in furniture and in textiles. So as both of those industries bring more of that back to the US, they're gonna to come to North Carolina because they know it's a part of our DNA. It's a part of what we know and have done very well. And so we've gotta position ourselves to be able to capture some of that. And so what um, they tell me they found in North Carolina were committed people who loved manufacturing, that loved furniture manufacturing for its beauty and for its everyday usage in our homes. Uh, he also found a great business climate, that it was a place that was competitive to do business from a cost standpoint. And he found a great community uh, here in this region and the triad uh, to embrace them and invite them in and a great site for them to do business in. So I think there were a lot of factors. Um, it's a joy to have them in North Carolina and it's a great joy to see them continue to grow. So not only have they made an initial investment, they've announced two expansions since they've been in the state. So they're a great customer for the state of North Carolina and a great employer. Um, Dave, in 1993, uh, you were instrumental. You were a sector of commerce in the state of North Carolina. And you were instrumental to attract two, my words, at that time, unlikely 
friends to join you in Manhattan. Um, people who had, you know, uh, ran for the same political office, and it was a pretty tough, pretty tough campaign. And that was Senator Jesse Helms and, and former Governor James Hunt. And you got them up to Manhattan to sit down with you to talk with a potential company that could have come to North Carolina. It was a story that uh, we all admired your leadership on. It got really close. It was really important. Tell us more. I wish, I wish I had a recording of the conversation, going to New York and coming back, because these two gentlemen were so unique and special, not only for the state of North Carolina, but to each other. And that for them to get together and to work so hard to bring Mercedes to North Carolina. Uh, Jim Hunt uh, wanted economic development for North Carolina. So one of the key reasons that he uh, asked me to get involved because of economic development in High Point and the Triad. And he had picked up on the idea of partnerships, public, private. And that takes into consideration uh, it's all the citizens of North Carolina. And it's very important, like Sharon just said, for Republicans and Democrats to work together for everybody. And one of the things that Jim Hunt said that I've never forgotten is that a job is the best social program there is. It brings pride to the individual, pride to the family, and it's just something that we as an administration need to be totally focused on. And, and, and Senator Helms knew this, participated, and it was a great meeting, and both of them have worked together on other issues since that time. And we did not get Mercedes here, they went to Alabama, <clears throat> and many thought that the incentives that we offered simply were not where they needed to be. Is that a right it, assessment? That is correct. I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, it, it, that Alabama, and all this is reported and well known, uh, came out with a package of incentives that was incredible. Uh, the highest that ever been afforded any company uh, in America. And that we in North Carolina came up with the biggest package of incentives that we had ever come up. And it was so far different, it was unbelievable. And it, it's, it's, it's something that still is playing out today and among cities and counties and the state and then how we in North Carolina compete with the other states in the nation. Um, Mercedes was a, a, a great company who has done a great job for Alabama. And North Carolina was known for its manufacturing, still known for its manufacturing, and that we felt that our citizens could really be of major help to Mercedes and all their suppliers. But after it's all said and done, it came down to about a half a billion dollars. And that is major. But Dave, isn't it, I mean, we, we would love to have a, an automotive uh, company move to North Carolina. I think we can all agree on that. The question is, you have to have a mega site to make that happen. And you have to have these incentives to attract a, such a company. Do you see that happening in the near future? Well, Sharon is right in the middle of it right now. All kinds of discussions are taking place uh, with the governor and the legislature. Um, but one of the things that I just read in the last couple of weeks, uh, Mexico is luring lots of automotive companies. And it's, it's not just the cost of labor, but it's they are providing good transportation. Uh, so there are a lot of parts of the equation. Um, yes, we would like to have automotive, and that it, it, but there is enormous competition throughout uh, North America. Well, Mr. King, it's nice to have you on the campus of High Point, North Car High Point University in High Point, North Carolina. And I have to tell you, and let me say it publicly, I think of this man often. And I think of him often because I get a blood test with some regularity. <laughs> and every time I get a blood test, I know he's making some money. <laughs> and so um, you, you are an amazing person. You are a guy who chairs a company that is growing by leaps and bounds. You oversee a management team that leads and guides 35,000 employees. You're doing business in 40 countries around the globe. 
Uh, every time I read something in the Wall Street Journal or somewhere, either buying a company or thinking about buying a company, uh, your stock seems to be doing quite well. What's up? Well, there's nothing I can say after that introduction that isn't going to make it worse uh, <laughs> for me. So um, thank you very much, and, you know, it's great to be here. You know, the, the healthcare industry is undergoing an incredible transformation. Um, I don't think when Congress, <clears throat> excuse me, passed the Affordable Care Act that anybody, we always say in healthcare, everything takes 10 years longer than we think it would, and this is the exception. The, the rate of change in healthcare um, over the last couple of years has been phenomenal. The, the creation of the healthcare exchanges, the elimination of many small group and individual plans, the expansion of Medicaid in many states leading to coverage for many individuals who previously didn't have coverage, the, crea the, the creation of mega hospital systems. I mean, we don't have an independent hospital in Alamance County anymore. It's now owned by Moses Cone, but Moses Cone is actually part of Carolina's healthcare, which is Charlotte to Greensboro to Alamance throughout the entire state. So, um, so it's a time of incredible transformation. And, and in times of transformation, um, the, the premium is on two things, I think. Uh, Nito and you, of all people, having made an unbelievable transformation here, can, can I think attest to it? And one is forward thinking, and the other is execution. So you have to be thinking forward about where is change taking you and how do you get ahead of the change. And at the same time, you can't take your eye off the ball of we have to execute um, every single day. We handle 2 million specimens a week. 110 million specimens a year, 300 million tests performed for people in 40 countries. Um, and we have to get those results out every single day. So, so vision and strategy are great and they're very important, but execution is, is where we live and die. So David, this is, uh, this is a U.S. Airways magazine, um, the November 2014 issue. And um, the U.S. Airways chose to do an eight-page story about High Point University, with, for which we're very grateful. And on page 62 of the story, I want to read you a paragraph and I want to get your reaction. It said, the High Point University's latest venture is a newly expanded School of Health Sciences and School of Pharmacy. The need for healthcare is predicted, the need for healthcare providers rather, is predicted to increase tremendously in the United States, which is exactly why HPU is at the forefront of health sciences and pharmacy education. Healthcare providers of the future need to be prepared to work together to maximize efficiency. Now, Mr. King, we're putting $120 million in these schools. Are we doing the right thing? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Look, you know, there's going to be a chronic shortage of primary care physicians in this, uh, in this country. We, we are not going to have enough primary care physicians to serve the population. As a result, of, and that's just numbers. So as a result of that, we are going to increasingly rely on nurse practitioners, physician assistants, highly trained people below the MD level who are going to have to triage patients, particularly in the rural environments where it's very, very difficult to, to attract physicians. So, so we're going to need health professionals below the MD level. Um, there's only one uh, program to train cytologists, who are the people who read slides for uh, pap smears and cancer, um, in the entire state left, because that has not been a priority for um, education in North Carolina. As a result, it's at Piedmont Community College, and we subsidize it because we hire a lot of cytologists from that program. That's a that's going to be an excellent source in the long term of um, employment and jobs, just as uh, Sharon was saying. Um, pharmacy, the pharmacist is going to become the linchpin of healthcare. Think about what are the most important uh, objective data that we have about patients. Number one, their lab values. I had to say that because I'm a lab guy. Number one, their lab values, but it's true. 50% of patients' records are lab values. And if you want to know what the other most significant value in the medical record is, it's medication. So the pharmacist is going to become the center point of helping patients to understand their medication, the interaction of their medication, what 
what that medication is going to do for them in the long term. So I, I think you're absolutely making the right decision. And in the long run, not only will it be good for High Point University, but it will be good for North Carolina. It will be good for our country because we will create high paying, high skill jobs that are going to make a difference in people's lives. You're so right. I mean, even in our programs here, we're attracting uh, 100 people, uh, very stellar faculty and, and, and support staff who've come from all over the country to come and work here. And so uh, education is a big part of the economy. Education creates jobs. It has economic impact on the communities in which these universities reside and the communities at large. I'm so glad you asked the question because it is the conversation we need to be having in North Carolina that as an education leader, we're talking with business leaders to say, what is it that you need for your long-term success? And how do we prepare young people in North Carolina so that those jobs become their opportunity? And it, you cannot separate education from economic development. Uh, as we talk with companies that are here, that are looking to expand or are expanding, as we talk with companies about coming, there's not one of those conversations that there isn't a conversation about available workforce and that is very paramount relative to their education. What kind of skills do they have? What kind of experience that they have? So I think part of the great success of High Point University has been your attending to the needs of the businesses in this region to say, what is it that you need to be successful? And you've responded to that, and that's driven your curricul curriculum. And that's really what we have to do statewide. It's not necessarily what do you want to study, although it's great if you can do that, but what is it that you study that equips you for a lifetime of uh, you know, important work and, and meaningful work. Um, so thank you for asking the question and thanks for positioning this university. It's one of many in the state have done it to respond to business needs because that's where the match has to be made. And yet, and yet uh, Madam Secretary, um, higher education is going through mega transformation. Higher education both on the private sector and the public sector uh, is being tested in ways that we have not seen in our own lifetime. This uh, third, fourth, fifth century model uh, has had to realign itself, reinvent itself, to be innovative, entrepreneurial, for it to exist. Here's the, here's the chronicle of higher education. This is the trade, this is the trade paper for all higher education. Uh, this is the October 17, 2014 issue. And you know what the headline says? Many colleges cannot fill seats. And it goes on to talk about 38% of colleges missed their goals for enrollment. 43% missed their goals for revenue this year. Um, we at Hype University haven't experienced that. We grew by 20% this year. We haven't missed any goals in nine and a half years for precisely the reasons you've just cited, that you have to be innovative. And our students, when they graduate, any students from any university, when they graduate, Research tells us that they may have as many as 45 jobs in their lifetime. Mm -hmm. A, they're going to live longer. B, the jobs of tomorrow are yet to be invented. C, companies are dependent more on technology than ever before. There are demands that we had not heretofore uh, foreseen. What, what is your take on, on this vis-a-vis -vis North Carolina? Here we have a great public university system. We have 35 or 36 private colleges and universities. We have 55 or so community colleges. Uh, we are a state that is pregnant with institutions that, that um, provide higher education to our, to our populace and beyond. What, what is your take on that and how does that relate more uh, definitively with commerce? Uh, the richness of North Carolina's educational system is part of our greatness. Um, you don't have to talk to many folks that you don't quickly hear, look at the universities that you have, both private and um, public universities. We're so fortunate and so blessed. But I think at an educational level, we're having to do what we've been doing at a business level for the last 20 years. In a period of declining state revenues, you can't cut your way to success. <laughs> no, I've never seen a business do that, uh, and, I, and, and no educational institution is going to be able to do that. You've got to rethink what you're doing, and it means you will start doing some new things and stop doing some old things and continuing some things uh, that are, are paramount to your long-term success. But you can't continue to do the same things and expect a different result. And that level of change is painful. 
Um, but it is what has allowed LabCorp and other businesses to be successful in our state that they've been willing to make some very hard decisions through the process and evolution of change. We have to do the same thing in education, and it is painful, uh, and it's not without some um, very tough questions being asked. I think the, I keep saying the answer to so many of these questions, however, to get this economy going again, get revenues up, then we can make some investments that really uh, bring reward, uh, both in the educational situation and in many other areas of, of a life in North Carolina. But I think we have to rethink what we're doing. I think you've got to be much more in tune to business needs. Um, we have started something in North Carolina called North Carolina Works. What I found in Commerce, which is responsible for our uh, Department of Employment Services as well as the, the Division of Employment Services and, and Workforce Solutions, uh, lots of different government departments, each in their own silo, doing their own thing. And what we began to talk about, Scott Rawls, president of our community college system and myself, and uh, Dr. Tom Ross, who uh, leads our university system, is how do we develop a seamless process where folks who need employment find their way into the educational process and into employment, and those who need employees can find their way seamlessly to those who are looking for work with skills that might be applicable to their job opportunities. So we're reframing the whole conversation under a common vision called NC Works, and it's about connecting those dots. But it means taking down some silos, and it means uh, changing how we do work. And that's um, positive change in state government comes painfully slow. <laughs> uh, but I think if we are to survive, and if we're continuing to serve the citizens of North Carolina, we have no choice but to do it. So. I've approached this in commerce as I've operated businesses in the past, not as a, I've had no government experience, which some would say would be a great detriment, I see it as an asset, because I'm not hung up with the way we've always done it. So um, education is a integral part of what we're doing in commerce. Can't separate the two. Oh, you're so right. Uh, Dave, you've had, you've had a very colorful career, to say the very least. Uh, you have run a textile company you have uh, run a factoring company. Uh, you are today involved in business, venture capital, et cetera. Um, you have uh, worked as a volunteer in government, uh, i.e. Uh, DOT and EDC, and here in the Piedmont. You were the founder, actually, of the Piedmont Tribe Partnership, which still exists today. And, um, and then you, um, you represented your country in another land as a U.S. ambassador. In all of that, and then you've traveled extensively around the world, both personally and professionally. In all of that, what would be the two or three things that you would say to our students today about, about life, about business, about um, relational capital, people, how our world is going, what's going on, how they can prepare themselves in ways that they can be productive. They, we have many students who aspire to be like you. They, they, they want to achieve. Um, our students here believe in free enterprise. They believe in the initiatives that made America great. They believe in the fundamentals that built this country in the first place. You represent that to your core. Nito, it, it you and I have known each other for 40 years, and, and I, I first of all want to say that here I am, born and raised in the neighborhood. It's an honor for me to be here uh, on High Point campus, High Point University. It's just phenomenal what has occurred here. And Nito uh, is what he's done, not just for High Point U, but it, what he's done for High Point. And he mentioned one other thing that ties into this conversation, uh, a regional partnership. Uh, both these gentlemen are on the Triad Regional Partnership. And what it means are a group of people coming together across county lines, city lines, to communicate, to get to know each other, and talk about economic development, the benefit for the greater area. And we started off at High Point and the High Point Economic Development Corporation because the city, the city was not talking to the, to the citizens of High Point. And this was 25 years ago when there was the High Point Economic Development Corporation that was formed where it's 50% controlled by the city and 50% controlled by the citizens. And they talk openly about the problems of the city and what they're trying to accomplish, but it's communication. And the same thing has to do with when I served as an ambassador to Estonia, is that country needed to learn more about America. 
And somebody recently said, well, how do you define being a diplomat? And I thought and I said, well, I'm a salesman and I'm selling America. It's just like I'm selling High Point or the Piedmont Triad or North Carolina. It's communication. And I told this particular group, I said, I was a salesman for America. And they said, well, what was your product? What did you sell? Which I thought was an incredible question. And I said, I sold these citizens of this country. I said, I sold them on the idea of America stands for independence, freedom, democracy, and capitalism. And they are a great example of how they've come out of the Soviet Union and doing that. But it's, it's communicating to not only the people in your hometown, but people around the world and trying to get like Mercedes to come to North Carolina. It, 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 it's more than just incentives. That was a very high profile incentive. And it took a lot of communication to try to get through to where we were, where it was only two of us standing. But it, it, the, the incredible amount of success that North Carolina has had. Uh, 20 years ago, North Carolina was the leading nation in, leading the state in the nation of economic development, uh, as reported by the Wall Street Journal. Well, it was because the state of North Carolina has gone out and has communicated to other states and has gone around the world and communicated. And it's, it's, it's telling our story. So it gets back to communication, Nito, and you are terrific at communication. And I just think it's fabulous what you've done for High Point. Thank you very much. You know, um, speaking of communication, um, a man named Truett Cathy founded Chick-fil-A. And he created this chicken sandwich and he founded a, uh, one store in uh, Atlanta and then he built it in a, measure, in, a, in a measurable way across America. And today, I think the company does about, uh, similar to you, Dave, they're, they're in the five billion, five to six billion dollars um, um, revenue stream on an annual basis. And Truett Cathy just passed away. He's, he's been to this campus. Uh, we have a Chick-fil-A on this campus, uh, which he did not want us to do because we were not big enough, and we finally convinced them that we are entrepreneurial enough and we like to eat. So um, he passed away. And another gentleman who is the chairman CEO of Coca-Cola wrote in the Wall Street Journal a tribute to Mr. Cathy of late. Um, Mohtar Kent uh, is the chairman and CEO of Coca-Cola Worldwide. He came to this campus to speak to our students as well, Th thanks to one of our trustees, uh, Dr. Tom Haggai, who helped bring him here. Uh, this is what Mr. Um, Mohtar Kent, chairman and CEO of Coca-Cola, said about Truett Cathy. And I want to read this to you because I want to ask you, what is your opinion about what it takes to be a leader, whether it's in commerce, in business, in life. Mr. Ken said, you know, there are six things that really made this man stand out. First, Truett believed in himself. All outcomes have to come out of belief. When you have faith, when you have courage, when you have beliefs, you can make something happen. Second, he said, Truett worked hard. Something we say to our students every day, you gotta work hard. It'll work smart. Third, he said, Truett embodied the culture of service. He cared about people. He wanted to serve people. It mattered that people received good service. Fourth, he said, Truett never stopped innovating. Innovation, innovation, innovation in education, in, in medicine, in technology, and so on. Fifth, he said, Truett was generous. We often on this campus quote the words of William Barclay, the Scottish theologian who said, always give without remembering, always receive without forgetting. And finally, he said, Truett Cathy was humble. And even when he had achieved greatness in terms of financial resources, in terms of societal respect, in terms of commercial success, he remained humble. Dave, what do you think are the one or two primary qualities that a business leader has to be, has to have, 
to sustain himself or herself in a world that is so demanding, so competitive, and ever-changing. So I think um, I would agree with all six of those, but there's a couple I would at least offer by way of addition, Nito. And the first one is, um, I think you have to learn to act on imperfect information. So when we go to law school, we learn that the most important thing is to have all the facts. And then when we get into life, we learn that we never have all the facts. So we have to learn to make decisions without having all the facts. And I learned that as a young lawyer when I had a very demanding client who said to me, I want to know how much it's going to cost to get 70% certainty that I'm going to win. And I'm not going to pay for 80% or 90% if I can just pay for 70%. And it was a great lesson to me, and one I've carried with me all my life, which is you're going to have to make decisions based on a 70% probability. Some will be right, some will be wrong. But you need to learn how to make decisions with imperfect information. So, so does that demand, therefore, a, a sense of courage? What, what, does that, what does that then demand of the leader to perform and execute in in a purposeful way. So, so it's a great, it leads into the second thing I was going to say, which is you, you have to have a point of view on things as a leader. You must have a point of view. You can't, when you're in a meeting as a leader, and I'm sure this is true, in any meeting that you preside over, you preside over, or you preside over, at the end of the discussion, no matter how robust the discussion is, when it comes time to make the decision, all the eyes turn to you. And so you have to have a point of view. And you have to, Yes, have courage to state your position and believe in it. You have to have enough followership so that when you make a decision, the people who disagree with it are not going to walk out of the room and start undercutting it. Um, and, and you have to realize that you're going to make mistakes and you're going to have failures. And as I was recounting to some of the students earlier, if you don't make mistakes and if you don't have failures, then you're not trying anything hard. You're not doing anything important because anybody can have 100% success at doing things that are easy. And then the last thing that I would offer, um, Lito, on, the, on that uh, topic is, you know, I think as a leader, in addition to acting on imperfect information and having a point of view, um, you, you, need to, you need to understand how, you, how to relate to the people who you're leading. So I'm privileged to lead a company with 35,000 people. 20,000 of them are couriers, phlebotomists, people who draw your blood when you go in to get your blood drawn. Um, I, those are people who have to always see me, no matter how bad it is, with a smile on my face, an upbeat attitude, we're going to come through this fine, whether it's the financial crisis of 2009 or whether it's you know the top of the market. Um, so. Understanding your constituency and, and who you have to lead and how to, and how to be a leader is, is very important because no matter what the size of your organization, different people have to be led in different ways. And, and you, we as leaders have to adjust ourselves to those constituencies. Mm -hmm. So Dave, um, a parent of one of our students at Hyper University, her name is Sally Hogshead. She just wrote a wonderful book. The book is called How the World Sees You. And I want to read you something from that because you just touched on it. And then I'm going to ask each of you, what is it that, that you think you exemplify in your own life that has helped you succeed uh, based on what I'm about to read? This is what she says. The key, therefore, is to fully recognize your differences rather than just your strengths. The reality is strengths can be copied. It's true for your company and also for you. Products can be replicated. Benefits can be improved upon. Secret formulas can be uncovered. Winning systems can be beaten. People can outdo your strengths, but nobody can outdo who you are. Your personality is the only aspect of your work that nobody can copy. People can copy your product, your pricing, your actions, your recipe, or program, or formula, but they can never replicate who you are. Who you are is the greatest differentiator you've ever had. Sharon, what is it that differentiates you as a person, and then what is it that differentiates North Carolina as a state? Mm, great question. Uh, I would say it is that that differentiates me. I 
um, I have uh, built a career and a personal life using what God has given me. And I'll tell you how I best learned that, although I think it was a lesson my parents taught me from a very early age. Use what you have. You've been gifted in unique ways. Be proud and use it. But um, I was a young professional at Duke Power, and I realized that there was opportunity there. And I had a degree in consumer sciences from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. For those of you in the room who are my age, that was home economics in our era. And uh, I started with Duke Power as a home economist demonstrating microwave ovens. And at night, I would talk about the importance of nuclear power in the Carolinas, but I was demonstrating microwave ovens during the day, newfangled appliance. And um, I noticed that all the men I was working for and all the men around me who were doing well were all engineers. So I had gotten my first promotion and gone to work in Charlotte, and it was a pretty regular basis that I would see Bill Lee there, who was the chairman of the company, and he was always quite friendly, always knew the folks there by name. And he would sit down at the table with me and talk, and he said one day at the end of lunch, he said, Any, anything I can do for you, just let me know. Just call Phyllis and get an appointment. So I was looking around me and seeing these engineers and thinking, you know, I probably need to get an engineering degree. I like this company. I think I would like to stay here. I think I could have a good career here. And so maybe I should go back to school at night. And they had a new engineering program at UNCC. So I made an appointment to see Mr. Lee. And I went in, sat in his office, and he came in, sat at the other end of the table from me. And we started talking. He said, how can I help you? And I said, I need a little advice. I think I have a future in this company. And I would like to have a future here. And um, I'm thinking maybe I should start working on my engineering degree in the evenings, because I'm noticing that all the leadership here have engineering degrees. And he didn't just sit there, he stood up at the table and he pointed his finger at me and he said, why would you want to do that? And I said, well, I'm noticing that all of you have engineering degrees. And he said, that's exactly why you don't need one. He said, Sharon, you understand that we serve customers. We think about it as serving meters. We think about customer service in terms of the number of miles of lines and the number of poles we've put in the ground. You think about women that are caring for their families and men that are operating businesses and ladies that are starting their own businesses, and you think about it in terms of a customer. We've never thought about it that way before. He said, don't change a thing. Keep learning. Maybe you pick up a few more courses in finance and business, but keep doing what you do well, which is different than any of the rest of us do. And it was a lesson for a lifetime. And uh, there have probably been times that folks I worked with thought of what I did and how I led and how I went about the work was a little different, a little odd, but I've tried in each setting to find the unique way I could use the gifts I have, the abilities to communicate, the intuitive sense I have about how relationships can benefit outcomes, uh, the ability I have to connect people. So I hope that's the uniqueness about me is a willingness to do that. Sometimes when it is very obvious and maybe no, unpopular, that's okay. Um, what does the state have to offer? That's a hard one. We've been working on the development of a state brand and coming to a concise, crisp way to articulate who and what North Carolina is is a real challenge because a great part of our uniqueness is the fact that we are so diverse. From the mountains to the coast to the foothills and these Piedmont Plains, uh, to the diversity of people. We've become quite a melting pot and how much better and stronger we are as a state because of that. Uh, we're a diversity of educational institutions. We're a diversity of people. We're a diversity of industries, uh, diversity of lifestyles, diversity of vacation choices, all of those things. And that is our greatness and that is a great part of our uniqueness. But I would tell you at the root of it, um, it is about our people. Uh, there's something pretty amazing about the North Carolina culture and our willingness to innovate and create, our willingness to take risks and take chances, and story after story, your story, the story of Leon Levine and Family Dollar Stores, the story of Cree, uh, the, I mean, you just think about it, you, Red Hat, you can name all these companies where innovation, new technology, new ideas, an ability to take a risk, to be welcomed into a community, that's what North Carolina is. Mm -hmm. So what we, what we tell students every day that, that um, God created you for a purpose. We're a God family and country school, and we say that within you there is a giant. It's your job to awaken this giant somewhere along the path of life and, and to follow your passion, which is really what you're talking about. You follow your passion. You have purpose. When you have purpose, you can, you can create action. When you have action, you can create outcomes. And, and so that is very true.
Dave, how about you? What, what is it, in all the things that you've done, what is it that you believe was a differentiator for you? What they say in business, um, your differential advantage. Attitude. I used to wear a pin that said attitude. And I had it for years, and you have the HPU pin. And I, and I have it on my dresser. And, and, and it, my parents uh, taught me about attitude, but my wife's uncle gave me the pen. And I, it, 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 it makes all the difference in the world. And thinking about no matter what you do, here or anywhere else in the world, it's attitude. And we're all people. And I've learned that traveling the world, uh, in the business world, in the government world, and that if you sit down with these people, they are, they're people. They are, it's just incredible that we all can come together, but it gets back to communication. And so I, I think that it's, it's, you have that here at High Point U, but we have it in North Carolina. Uh, it's, it's, and you travel uh, the world and you hear so much about North Carolina. And it's, 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 it's just phenomenal and it gives me great pride because it's, it's, it's I think your, your school has great attitude, not just your students, uh, but your faculty. And it's, it, it, that state of North Carolina has it. Absolutely. We've always had it. Yeah. And we've, it, it's just something, and we're also very lucky that we are in a geographical location. We're on the East Coast, equidistance. You ever just sit back and think, Goodness gracious, here's High Point in the middle of North Carolina in the, in the East Coast, halfway between Florida and New York, and the infrastructure uh, going north and south and east and west in the, in the ports. Uh, then you get into the education, of course, but it's, 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 a, it's, it's a remarkable thing that we have this tremendous asset. And if you travel the other states, it just doesn't uh, exist. I mean, here in North Carolina, uh, it's existed for a long time, and I think that is one of our great attributes. But it gets back to the attitude of North Carolina. You know, Nito, our state uh, motto, which is written in Latin uh, on our flag, or on our seal, is to be rather than to seem, when translated into English. To be rather than to seem. And I think it kind of sums up what North Carolina is and the challenge we have to be. I think we live in a culture, and particularly as students, you live in a culture you know, if you're tall, you're not tall enough. If you're thin, you're not thin enough. If you're smart, you're not smart enough. There are so many messages um, uh, just bombing you daily, just saying it's not enough, it's not enough, and not, it's not enough. And, and I just am reminded in my own leadership journey when I have been most successful, I think it's when I've been recogni have recognized the gifts I uniquely have that might look very different than others. And I might be looking over my shoulder wishing I was this and wishing I was that, but when I'm willing to embrace who I am and what I have to work with and use it to its maximum potential, I think that's when good things begin to happen. I think that's when you can get focused on results and outcomes. It's, it's using that unique giftedness, and I think that's our challenge as a state. What is the unique giftedness and resources we have as a state? And capitalizing on that, using what we have, and we're going to look different than other states, and that's okay. So Dave, what about you? What, and, and, and not just about you personally, but I mean, here's a company that's done very, very well. And uh, what is it about this company that is different? Well, <clears throat> I, have, uh, I have always felt that one of the things that made me different, particularly as a lawyer, was that I tried to listen. A very smart person said to me one time, when my mouth is open, my ears are closed. And it is, could not be more true. Um, I hope my kids are not watching this program because they will disagree that I listen, but that's a whole separate topic. <laughs> um, I, I learned a great lesson by listening to a boss just as Sharon did, which is I, I, our former CEO called me into his office. and I sat in a chair just like this right across from his desk. He was a very imposing man. And he said, uh, you are a very talented young man. And I have only one issue with you. And I said, what's the issue? And he said, you're lazy. Now, I've not been called lazy all that often. Uh, he said, you're lazy about numbers. You don't pay attention to numbers. You have great intellect. You have great instincts. But you don't pay attention to numbers. I bought myself a scientific calculator. 
I carry the numbers. They're in my briefcase in my car right now. I carry the numbers, 60 pages of numbers with me. And every time I have a spare, whether it's in an airport or in a restaurant in a, in a spare moment, I spend time with the numbers because that was a very powerful lesson to me. And I think, you know, what makes our company different, if I could go back to a word that Dave used, the, the passion for taking care of patients is amazing. It's just amazing. Again, you know, we see, we see 400,000 patients a day. Those patients are undergoing an experience that for many is akin to the dentist's office, right? Someone is walking up to them with a large needle and sticking it into their arm and saying it's only gonna hurt for a minute. The passion for taking care of those people, for getting that blood from 1,700 collection centers and 10,000 doctor's offices into our laboratories, getting the results done, getting them out right with the, with the level of quality. Um, I think that's what makes us different. People really care about the patients, and I could tell you a lot of stories that make me incredibly proud of what our people have done to go above and beyond the call of duty, whether it was after 9-11, whether it was after Superstorm Sandy, whether it was to go above and beyond the call of duty to make sure that, that the patients are being taken care of. And, and you know, that's, that passion to the job that we are, that people trust us to do, um, is what makes the difference between us and our competition. So as you look forward in your business, what, what do you see? What can you tell us publicly? Um, the healthcare environment for the next several years is gonna continue to change at an incredible pace. We're, we're talking about whole new systems of payment. We're talking about a, a, a desire to reduce the cost of care without reducing the quality of care which will be an enormous challenge. Um, we're talking about um, in, the, in the process of trying to reduce the cost of care and particularly what the government is spending on care, we're talking about more people being turning 60, turning 70, turning 80 each year than we've had be 60, 70, 80 in the history of the United States. So the, the, the healthcare is gonna, is gonna continue to change and um, and we have to be ahead of that change, but we have to be visionary to stay ahead of the change, and at the same time, we, we have to maintain that passion for taking care of the people who we have to take care of every day, who trust us to draw their blood and it doesn't hurt, and get their results back to their doctor or their nurse practitioner or their provider so that the right decision can be made about their care. There's a guy called Ken Deitwald. Uh, Ken Deitwald is perhaps America's leading authority on aging. Uh, he was here to speak to our faculty and staff two or three months ago. And Ken has done extensive uh, research, empirical research, on what's going to happen to the aging population and therefore what kind of products and services they need and how we can prepare ourselves for living longer. And he said for, to our students, for example, that students are going to live to be 100, 110, the children will live to be 120, 130, maybe longer, that it is likely that we will live to be 100 with some degree of ease, given all the technology and all the medicine, medicine uh, uh, advancements and so on. And so I interviewed Ken and I, I asked him this question. I said, well, what is it then that we ought to do if we're gonna live such a long time? And he said three things. He said, number one, you, you gotta take care of your health, hence your business. If you don't take care of your health, it doesn't matter that you live a long time because if you're not feeling well, you know, it's not a good deal. Number two, he said, make sure you save enough money because you're gonna live longer than you ever thought you're gonna live. Make sure that you don't get caught with uh, a shortage of cash at the end of your life. And number three, which was the most telling, he said, was you better discover a sense of purpose. Maybe that's attitude, uh, Dave, purpose. Why is it that you occupy space on this earth? How does it matter that you do what you do every day? What is it that we define on this campus as the primary, most fundamental, most significant work that we do? Which is not the imparting of information. These students can get more information um, by going uh, you know, online every day than we can teach them in a year. And so, it is all about discovering who you are, maturing, understanding that life is really about wisdom. What that 
gentleman told you about being less lazy with numbers was wisdom, a lesson taught you all your life. And I think we can all cite examples like that. So I think the future of, of education, the future of commerce, the future of business will always depend on brain trust, on human beings. Well, our, our time has come to an end. And unfortunately, because I, I have so many more questions I want to ask you, I was hoping to get really, really deep into some, some, some stuff, some secrets you've never told to your own spouses. <laughs> but um, obviously, I have failed in that regard. But nevertheless, we have extracted from you lessons to remember, uh, inspiration to behold. And we are grateful for each of you and to all of you for the leadership that you've given our state of North Carolina and by extension to all those who reside in the state and those who visit the state and those who have connections with the state. So thank you very much for being on this stage today to share with our audience your ideas, and I hope you'll come back here again. Ladies and gentlemen, you. would you please acknowledge. Quality Public Television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV.